That was just my test right there. Good morning. It's good to see you. I'd like to begin this morning asking you to complete two statements. First, God is. Now, love is. How you answer those two statements will define your relationship with God. What you believe about God and his love for you will influence how you relate to him. God is love. His very nature is perfect love. Our passage this morning comes from 1 John chapter 4. And as we turn there together, let's consider who is John and what authority does he have to write about God's love. As one of the 12 apostles, John learned directly from Jesus. He was part of Jesus' inner circle along with Peter and James. And it's believed that John is who the Bible refers to as the disciple whom Jesus loved. John was very close to Jesus. And it's in this proximity that he learned of God's grace, mercy, and love. We cannot be close to Jesus and not be affected by God's love. Let's read 1 John chapter 4, beginning at verse 7. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testified that the father has sent his son to be the savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the son of God, God abides in him and he in God. So we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love, and whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. On May 24th this year, fans around the world mourned the death of the queen of rock and roll. Born in Brownsville, Tennessee, and twice inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, Tina Turner famously saying, what's love got to do with it? In our Christian walk, in our relationship with God, love has everything to do with it. The greatest truth in all scripture is this, God is love. The apostle John knew the importance of love in our relationship with God and with others. About 30 times in 1 John chapter 4, he mentions love or beloved. That's how he starts. He starts with beloved. That's not a very common word that we use today. But John wanted to convey a message that we are dearly loved. Many psychologists claim the need to be loved as a basic and fundamental longing in every human heart and that we all have two questions we wonder. First, Will someone love me? And second, once they get to know me, will they still love me? Friends, this morning, I hope you leave here convinced that God loves you. Not because you deserve his love, but because love is who he is. God is love. Twice in this passage of scripture, John states clearly and definitively, God is love. And it's important for us to understand this statement. He does not say God is loving. He certainly is. 
But more than this, his very nature is love. The only way God will ever relate to us is in love. If we cannot accept the truth that God loves us, we will be limited in how we relate to him. When we're not convinced God loves us and things don't work out the way we want, we may resent God or we might think that he doesn't care about us. We see in 1 John chapter 4 a relationship of God's love for us, our love for him, and love for one another. God first loved us. He didn't wait for us to do good, to do the right things. He made his, known, he made his love for us known by sending his son into the world that we could be saved from our sins and that he would live in us and his love perfected in us. The way we express our love for God depends on the kind of relationship we have developed with him. In order for our love for him to grow, we must spend time with him, listen to his voice, and experience the love he has for us. God's perfect love is known by us as we love him and love one another. If we accept God's love, we can return love to God and to each other. God is love. His very nature is perfect love. But because of sin, love does not always come freely and naturally to his children. It may be that you have never experienced or known unconditional love. And accepting God's love for you may be difficult. It can be hard for all of us to accept God's love for us. It's, we can't comprehend the depth and the varied aspects of God's love. In our human experience, love is not always very loving. We live in a culture that is confused about real love. We say we love many things. God's love is completely different from ours. The Bible helps us understand what real love is and what it is not. Listen to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. Love does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. God is love. Love is eternal. Love has no limits. Love never says, you've gone too far. I can't love you now. And all things means everything is included. Pastor Tim Keller said the gospel is this. We're more sinful and flawed in ourselves than we ever dared believe. Yet at the same time, we're more loved and accepted in Jesus Christ than we ever dared hope. As I wrap up this morning, beloved, remember this. Jesus loves me. This I know, for the Bible tells me so. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for the day, for to be in your house and how you loved us. You've given us the church that we might love you and praise you and worship you and love one another. Lord, change us. Make us more like your son who gave everything to show his love for us. Pray for Sam and for Paul as they bring the rest of the message this morning. Bless the worship team and the song we sing. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you guys stand and sing this with me? Was love.
Good morning, church. Man, this is exciting. Uh, if you want to go ahead and open your Bibles up to Romans chapter 3 and chapter 6, uh, we're going to be jumping around a little bit. I don't know if you know, but there are 131 references to the word grace in the English Standard Version of the Bible. 131. I promise you I'm not going to read all of them today. We're just going to scratch the surface a little bit. Uh, but we're going to start in Romans chapter 3 and 6. <clears throat> we, as humans, are imperfect sinners. Romans 3.23 tells us, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Every one of us are sinners, period. So if this is true, when Paul goes on to write in Romans 6, For the wages of sin is death, we can rightfully assume that because of our sin, what we deserve is death. But there is hope. If you're reading ahead, you probably know that I only gave you half of both of those verses. Romans 6.23 says, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. There is a free gift from God, friends. So what is that free gift? Well, Romans 3.23 and 24 tell us, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is Christ Jesus. The next attribute we're going to talk about today is grace. Grace is the free, unmerited gift of God that he pours out on us as opposed to the death, retribution, and destruction that we rightly deserve because of our sin. If you're taking notes, I'll make it a little bit shorter for you. Grace is the unmerited, free gift of God to treat us better than we deserve. Grace is the unmerited, free gift of God to treat us better than we deserve. So if we believe that, that Romans 3 and 6 tell us that we've sinned and we are going to die because of that sin, but God has stepped in with his free gift of grace, how do we respond to that? How do we interact with grace to better understand it? And this is important whether you're a believer or this is the first time you've heard this idea of God giving us this free gift even though I've sinned. How do we respond to that? So while studying grace, I noticed the Bible give me three basic ways that we as humans can respond to God's grace. The first two can be seen in 1 Corinthians 15.10. 1 Corinthians 15, 10, Paul says, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace towards me was not in vain. Paul is telling us here to not let this incredible free gift of God to treat us better than we deserve go to waste, be in vain, be worthless, but to be enlightened by it and use it to change our lives. Grace is a life changing attribute of God. The first way that we can take this un unmerited free gift of God to treat us better than we deserve is to treat others with grace, to treat other people better than they deserve. If grace is in God's nature, if it's in his nature to treat us better than we deserve, and we are made in the image of God, like the Bible tells us, then therefore we should treat people better than they deserve. It's so easy nowadays, right, to find a small fault in someone, to, to if, if somebody makes one mistake, they say one wrong thing to you. We use that fault, that mistake to ruin their lives, to cost them their jobs, to, to push them away from us. Ultimately, we use that, the popular thing nowadays is cancel them, right? Somebody makes a mistake, they did something 15 years ago and we found it on Twitter, cancel them, right? Each of us in those moments would love a little bit of grace, right? We'd love for somebody to look at us and say, you know what, you messed up, but I know you're sorry and I forgive you. But when it's our turn to dole out the grace, it's a lot easier to deal out punishment than it is forgiveness. When in reality, our God sees all of our faults, the big ones and the small ones, and he still continues to pour out his love and forgiveness on us. That's his grace. And if we have been given this free, unmerited gift of God to treat, others or to treat us better than we deserve, then we should respond to that by treating people better than they deserve. 
The second way we can respond to God's grace is by not treating it as just fire insurance. Let me say that again. We don't want to treat it just as fire insurance, right? A lot of people believe that once we receive God's grace through salvation, we're good. It's over. We can go to heaven and we can move on. But in reality, Jesus tells us in Luke 9, 21, that if anyone is going to come after him, he should take up his cross daily and follow him. That means to let your old self die, right? The old self living in sin, full of sin, to let that die to the side and start walking in a way of someone who follows Jesus. We often misconstrue what, what grace is in the church. God's grace is not a free pass to act how we want. God's grace is an invitation to start living our life without sin. If we want to respond to how God has given us this free, unmerited gift to treat us better than we deserve, we can respond by turning away from sin and following him. Finally, we can respond to God's grace by accepting it through salvation. If you're sitting here today and you haven't accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I'm speaking directly to you. Ephesians 2, 8 through 9 tell us, for by grace you have been saved through faith, not as a result of your works so that no one can boast. Grace is the unmerited, free gift of God to treat us better than we deserve. And all God is asking in return is for faith. Faith here meaning to believe that he sent his son Jesus Christ to die on the cross in payment for our sin. Friends, if you're sitting here today and you haven't accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, but you're thinking, my life is falling apart. Things around me just can't get better. No matter what I do, no matter how hard I try, no matter what I do to work on it, things don't get better. Well, God has a good news for you. In his grace, all you have to do is accept it, believe that his son died on the cross for you, and you are saved. That's it. It's like the free sample at Sam's Club, right? Everybody loves a free sample from Sam's Club? I definitely do, right? That's the only reason I have a Sam's Club membership. The free sample is free. You don't have to pay for it. Someone else has already come along and paid for you to have that free sample. But you still have to reach out and take it off the table and eat it, right? That's what we have to do to, to get God's grace through salvation. To be saved, we have to reach out and take it. As I wrap up here, uh, I want to tell you that this is the good news of God's grace. This is the good news of God's grace. It's in his nature to treat us better than we deserve. It's not a choice that he makes, but it's simply in his nature to give us grace and treat us better than we deserve. He just wants to give it to you. Romans 11:6 says, but if it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace would no longer be grace. We can respond to that free, unmerited gift of God to treat us better than we deserve by treating others better than they deserve. Not turning back to our sin once we've been saved by grace and accepting his grace through salvation. If you're here today and you came prepared, or maybe you didn't come prepared, but God's speaking to you, to accept his son as your savior. We want to give you that opportunity. I'll be in the back, Alex is in the back, our prayer team is in the back. We would love to talk to you more about this incredible free gift that God wants to give you through his salvation. Grace is the unmerited free gift of God to treat us better than we deserve. We can respond to that today. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you. You pour out on us what we don't deserve. You continue to give even though we continue to take, Lord. And we pray that you continue to bless us, that you open the minds and hearts of those in here, that they, they may treat others better than they deserve, that they'll turn away from their sin and follow you. And that if they're here today and don't know you personally, that they'll take the opportunity to accept your son as their savior. It's in your holy and precious name we pray, amen. Let's continue to worship this morning, let's stand.
As a language learning model, that's for you, Tim. (laughs) 
Actually, it's such a privilege to share the stage uh, this morning with Chuck and Sam. You guys did awesome, and I love you. Uh, I want to tell you a little story. In third grade, you know, you reach that line of demarcation at some point in school, and I apologize to all the educators out here today in advance, Diana. That you reach that point in school where you go from you got a, your teachers are really sweet to you and, and, and kind, and then all of a sudden you get to that point where uh, it's time to instill some discipline. And third grade was that point for me. Uh, you know, I was blessed or cursed, depending on how or uh, when you assess it with a teacher that, uh, quite frankly, she was no nonsense and she didn't have time to put up with any B, you know what. And uh, she was impossible for me to read. She was always able to pinpoint, you know, the principal cause of trouble in class. Uh, she'd nip it in the bud before a note got passed or before I could hit Michael Braxton with a spitball in the side of the neck. It didn't matter. She, it was like she had, uh, she was the epitome of a total dictator. She had eyes in the back of her head, you know what I'm saying? The only escape was a couple of times a day you had the little boy's room where you had like two minutes of respite where it was chaos and mass pandemonium where you could get away with anything. And it was there, you know, that the double dog dares got the best of me and I decided I was going to cement my legacy in third grade lore. And I climbed up on the bathroom countertop and proceeded to direct my bare backside towards the door and say, this is for you, Miss O. And as the last, exactly. You know, but as the last syllable left my lips and a dead silence fell over that latrine, I, I, knew, in adv- I knew right then that she was already looking at me. <laughs> and this was all going down in real time. And I also knew that I'd be dead before dinner. You know, and as, as an adult, I, I certainly know that Mrs. O was not omniscient or all-knowing. But as a child, she sure seemed that way to me. And there was no doubt that my mama was omniscient because she was up at that school, which was a 30-minute bus ride for me in the morning, but it only took her two minutes to get there. All joking aside, let's define omniscience. Britannica defines omniscience as knowing everything or having unlimited understanding or knowledge. From a divine standpoint, omniscience is God fully knowing himself and all things actual and possible in one simple and eternal act. So, the first part of the definition, knowing himself. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11, reads, For who among men knows the thoughts of man except his own spirit within him? So too, no one knows the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. The first criterion of omniscience is God fully knowing himself which is something only he is able to do. As A.W. Tozer says in his book, The Knowledge of the Holy, only the infinite can know the infinite. By knowing himself, the perfect author and source of all things, it is only fitting that there is nothing beyond his grasp or knowledge. Knowing all things actual, Psalm 147, verses four and five, He determines the number of the stars and calls them each by name. Great is our Lord and mighty in power. His understanding has no limit. Based on scientific findings of the densities of galaxies that our technology can see, experts estimate there are 200 sextillion stars in the universe. Now to to put it in numbers that you can understand, that's 200 billion trillion. That's an incomprehensible number for us to grasp. And we know that's still not even correct because only God knows the exact number and the exact location. And the scripture tells us he's already named each one of them. Luke 12, seven tells us that even the hairs on your head are numbered. I mean, what an assurance that our God knows us so deeply. And knowing all things possible, Isaiah 55, verse 11, so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. 
He knows what is possible and speaks it into existence knowing that it will accomplish exactly what he wants in the way that he wants. In 1 Chronicles 28, 9, he says, As for you, my son Solomon, know the God of your father and serve him with a loyal heart and with a willing mind. For the Lord searches all hearts and understands all the intent of the thoughts. If you seek him, he will be found by you. But if you forsake him, he will cast you off forever. He knows every possible outcome of every potential decision being made at this very moment. But the coolest part about it is he already knows what decision was made. So now that we know what, that God knows himself, all things that are actual and all things that are possible, we have to accept these following tenets. Number one, we are finite beings, only capable of finite knowledge. God is infinite both in his existence and his knowledge. Because of this, we can never completely grasp God from a quantifiable standpoint of his fullness and magnitude. He chooses to only reveal to us that which our limited minds can comprehend. The very fall of man was predicated around this in the Garden of Eden, the tree of knowledge. The good news is in 1 John 3, verse 2, it promises us that although we are already God's children, he has not yet shown us what we will be like when Christ appears. But get this, but we do know that we will be like him, for we will see him as he really is. The vision of God will be the consummation of us knowing him. I don't need to know what he knows. I just want to be there when he appears. The Almighty is the criterion of truth and falsity. It is inconceivable that God could be wrong about anything. He does not learn. There is nothing the Lord can be taught, nor must he deduce anything through reasoning. There is no probability with God. Because of his absolute knowledge, there only is and there is not. And God does not question himself. For instance, in Genesis 6, 6, when God says he regrets making man, do not let our limited understanding of regret get in the way of why God allowed things to happen according to his plan for the future. God questions us to bring us to a place of accountability, not because he doesn't know what we have done. So I leave you with this. Take heart in the words of John in 1 John 3. Verse 20, for whenever our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart, and he knows everything. Pray with me. Father God, your knowledge is amazing and all-encompassing, and Lord, we're thankful that you know us so deeply. Lord, we just praise you today for all these attributes that we've discussed. In Jesus' name, amen. Worship with us. Thanks, Mason.